Amanda Cadabra and the Hanging Tree by Holly Bell Read by Holly Bell Chapter 1 Amanda's Unusual Talent It was difficult to make out what it was. The fog was being compounded by smoke from a nearby garden bonfire. Amanda ventured closer. Oh, just a sack of old leaves, wasn't it? Probably from last autumn. Strange, though. It wasn't like Irene to be untidy. Another few steps. No. She stood stock still, the mist clinging to her skin. Amanda looked up at the branch above her, then down at the form beneath. The rope attached to it lay there like a pale, dead snake. Surely not. Not this. Not here. The day began promisingly. Amanda awoke naturally after a full night's sleep to the song of the blackbird. There'd been some hazy dream or other. One of the downsides of being a back sleeper was that she often surfaced to find a cat on her stomach, and not just to any cat. Tempest, her familiar, was thick-furred in a collection of storm greys, citrine-eyed and constitutionally disgruntled. Tempest, sensing his human was stirring, moved up to her chest and pushed his head out from under the quilt. Amanda smiled blearily, rubbing one blue eye and stroked his head. Good morning, Tempest. He stared at her meaningfully. Yes, I know, she acknowledged tolerantly. Breakfast. I must get up anyway. I have magic practice. Forty minutes later, found Amanda, clad in green boiler suit and trainers, mouse brown hair in a messy plait, kneeling on the floor of her furniture restoration workshop, but not yet engaged in restoration. She was instead screwing spare antique bow handles next to the four edges of an old flat-surfaced door. Observing Amanda with a mixture of ennui and amusement was Tempest. There, she pronounced optimistically. That should do it. First, a test run. Erival inentil, she pronounced and the door rose gently into the air until she halted its progress with Sessiblin and landed it with Sedasig. This was Amanda's particular gift, inherited through Perrin, her grandfather, from the Cadabras. Since his elopement with Sonara, ne Carduban of the nefarious neighbouring witch clan, he had been ostensibly estranged from his family. Yet he had never regretted the union with his beloved Sonara. Of course, as far as the village was concerned, the couple were now, in what the transitioned regarded as vulgar parlance, dead. They were, in fact, enjoying a somewhat different plane of existence from which they made frequent visits, either spontaneously or at Amanda's request. However, currently, she and Tempest were the sole occupants of the workshop. It was here where Perrin had taught all, or at least most of what he knew to Amanda, to whom he had bequeathed it, together with the Vauxhall Astra. The vehicle was in British racing green, and along each side bore the legend in gold script, Cadabra Furniture Restoration and Repairs. His granddaughter was presently regarding the door on the floor with satisfaction, coupled with a degree of hesitation. Good, she pronounced. And now? 
Amanda took a deep breath and stepped onto the door, sat down, and took hold of each of the two handles on the long sides. She focused and issued the command. Erval Inentil. Amanda opened her eyes wide at the strange sensation of rising off the floor, inch by inch. Distracted, she lost her concentration. The surface tilted wildly and she cried out instinctively, Grandpa, help me! Instantly, a tall, silver-haired man appeared and, smiling, steadied her with a gesture and landed the door. Ah, thank you, said Amanda with relief, putting a hand to her chest. Then, as a shocking thought occurred to her, she added, Grandpa, did you put a spell on me? Casting magic on humans was absolutely vetoed. It had got her and even the village of Sunken Madly into far too much trouble in the past. No, Bian, Perrin Cadabra assured Amanda, addressing her by his pet name for her, Cornish for baby. Just the board and the air around you. Calmed by his soft accent, hailing from the far southwest of the British Isles and unfailingly kindly manner, she sighed. Ah! Now her tell was clear to see. In the presence of magic, the tiny brown islands in the sea of her blue eyes expanded into continents. Her close work glasses helped to hide it, but anyone who knew what to look for could observe the singular effect. All right, asked Grandpa, ready to try again, just an inch or two off the ground this time. Yes, I don't have all that long to practice, by the way. I know, replied Grandpa, nodding. You're meeting the inspector at a quarter past nine to give him the official sunken madly tour. That's right. OK, I'm ready. Back on the horse, or should I say, door. The somewhat wayward village of sunken madly to which Detective Inspector Thomas Trelawney of the Devon and Cornwall Police was now assigned, lay 13 miles to the north of the Houses of Parliament and three miles south of the border of Hertfordshire. Its roots in the rural landscape from which it had grown over a period of 800 years were still in evidence to those who cared to look. It was embraced by ancient orchards and the sheltering Madley Wood. The village was a long way, in every sense, from the Cornish coastal town where Trelawney had been born and bred. The inspector was a study in unobtrusiveness, in classic, well-cut grey suit and quiet, self-patterned matching tie. His short, light brown hair was neither styled in a dated manner nor at the edge of current fashion. His features were pleasant. He was well-spoken, accentless, his manner mild and courteous. The sort of man Amanda had often thought one did not notice until one really noticed. Trelawney looked at his watch. He decided that he had sufficient time to make a diversion to the corner shop for a snack pack of almonds. There'd been a toaster crisis at his mother's, which had been the school holiday's home of his youth after his parents' divorce, and breakfast had turned into a rather vague affair. His arrival at the nerve centre of the village coincided with the approach of Dennis Hanley Page, a septuagenarian whose exuberant progress through life was entirely uninterrupted by the passing of the years. Dennis was at that moment manifesting his eclectic musical taste. The final few bars of Rock the Casbah by The Clash echoed down the street, followed by the opening of Dolly Parton's Nine to Five as Dennis approached at 70 miles an hour. 
a red triumph spitfire, Dennis's latest acquisition as proprietor of vintage vehicles raced into view. The village had somehow managed to maintain a legacy speed limit from either the 1930s or 70s. Trelawney was simply grateful that he was not there to police the traffic and entered the corner shop while Dennis parked and secured his car. Ding! The door heralded the inspector's entrance. Pen hates therapists. Joan, the post lady, was saying to Mrs Sharma, proprietor, and Sylvia, the high-vis vest-clad octogenarian lollipop lady. She was but recently arrived at the establishment from her labours of safely ushering the school children across the road. This duty she performed with the aid of her round stop sign on a long pole, hence her job title. Hello, Inspector, they chorused in a warm welcome. Joan brought him up to speed. We're talking about the new renter of the Sharma's shop at the end of the high street here, and I was about to say, as no one could hate our new therapist, he's a sweetie. Oh, I know, enjoined Sylvia. That would be like hating Mother Teresa or Stephen Fry, returned Joan. Ding! went to the shop door. Or Dolly Parton, chimed in Dennis, debonairly sweeping off his tweed cap. Everyone likes Dolly Parton. We know you do, returned Sylvia with a grin after they had greeted him. Well, commented Joan, my Jim says, what with my hair and my curves, that I'm a tall size 16 ringer for Dolly, bless him. You've got a good man there, Joan, Sylvia remarked. Oh, I have, I have. You know, when we was courting, and I might have told you this story before. Trelawney was aware of the time and his appointment with his landlady-to-be and his new partner, Miss Cadabra. However, he was even more conscious of his new status in the village, with its upgrade from honorary village to village. He had been warned that Sunken Madley was not like his Cornish hometown of Parhale, and they would have their own pace. This was the last place he'd expected to end up, and the last business he'd ever imagined he'd be embroiled in. Detective Inspector Thomas Trelawney had regarded magic as a lot of mumbo-jumbo, and himself as a modern man, living in a modern world, solving modern and also admittedly age-old crimes with the aid of modern techniques. And then... That was Chapter One of Amanda Cadabra and the Hanging Tree by Holly Bell Read by Holly Bell Available in e-reader and paperback formats from Amazon, Kobo, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble and other bookstores. <laughs>